Hey everybody, Marcus here. I've been thinking about the idea that has been thrown around in MGTOW in viewing all women as, well, essentially whores. Now, this idea can, well, easily be disproved. A woman can be a whore if and only if she is sexually active. There exist women who are not sexually active, for example, virgins. Therefore, there exist some women who are not whores. Necessarily, not all women are whores. Though this argument is valid and sound, it somehow does not capture the spirit of what is being described when it is asserted that all women are whores. Uh, it seems like a refutation to a straw man. Well, perhaps we should start at the beginning and first capture the spirit of the sentiment before constructing any arguments around it. Firstly, there are prostitutes. Such women are whores by, well, the dictionary definition. Next, we have the non-prostitute variety of women who we call whores by virtue that they exchange sex for, well, things like dinners, trips, and anything else we see as part of the courtship process. We also see women using sex to get ahead in life, such as sleeping your way to the top. Now, these examples are the ones we would often cite as a representation of whorish behavior and seem to culminate in the idea that all women are whores. However, there are other examples that describe terms under which women engage in sex other than these. Women will throw themselves at rock stars, celebrities, and other men who are perceived to have high status. Some women, well, just enjoy sex a great deal and do it for the mere pleasure. Others will have sex with a low-status male because he has a big dick or fucks a female friend's boyfriend for revenge. Contrary to the initial set of behaviors, the second set, though containing willful acts of sex, do not have a whorish quality to them, at least not in the same sense as the first set. What unifies the first set is that they have a final cause of material gain. Let us refer to sex of this type as materialistic sex. The second set is unified in that all items seem to have a hedonistic final cause. Let us refer to this type of sex as hedonistic sex. Though it can be argued that all acts of sex a woman will engage in will include some element of pleasure and therefore could be considered hedonistic sex, I would like to distinguish between the two types on the grounds that each category indicates the primary motivation for sex having taken place secondary consequences merely while being accidental. It is also important not to conflate whorishness with promiscuity. Though we often use the label of whore in describing promiscuous women, let us contain such a notion to the term slut for the sake of this video. Now, hedonistic sex cannot be considered whorish behavior under the pain of broadening the definition of whore so wide that it encompasses all sex including sex we traditionally consider proper, such as sex within marriage. From this, it follows that a slut who only engaged in hedonistic sex is in fact not a whore. Materialistic sex, namely all sex acts whose final cause is material gain, is considered as whorish behavior. A woman who has sex for cash is differentiated from a woman who has sex for food merely by per her preferred mode of compensation. As the method of compensation is irrelevant, it follows that a woman who engages in materialistic sex ought to be considered a whore. Now, can it be said that every act of sex a prostitute engages in is materialistic sex? Well, surely not. After all, prostitutes do engage in hedonistic sex off the clock, as it were. From this it follows that a prostitute may engage in both materialistic sex and hedonistic sex. However, we would still consider a prostitute a whore, even though not all acts of sex she engages in are materialistic. As such, a woman need not exclusively engage in materialistic sex to be considered a whore, but may engage in both materialistic and hedonistic sex. If what we have argued for so far is true, then every woman who has ever engaged in materialistic sex at any point in her life is a whore. Now, you might be saying to yourself, but Marcus, though it may be true a woman may have engaged in materialistic sex at some distant point in the past, it is no longer true that she is a whore if she stopped engaging in such sex and does not intend to do so in the future. Now, 
prima facie, this argument makes sense but falls apart under scrutiny. Let us take the following example. If a man has committed murder, does he cease to be a murderer if he does not murder anyone else in the future? Well, surely not. Having committed the act once is sufficient to brand such a man with the label of murderer. Though there are temporal qualifiers that we may apply to the label, of course. For example, we may call him a reformed murderer. Yet these qualifiers only narrow down the flavor of murderer he is without stripping him of the label itself. In this way, a reformed or retired whore is a whore nonetheless. It seems to be that when MGTOW say that all women are whores, they seem to be saying the following. Every single woman who has been sexually active has at some point committed an act of materialistic sex and as such commands the title of whore. Now, this seems to be true from a male perspective. Women tend to deny that acts of non-prostitutional materialistic sex ought to be considered whoring. Let us see if there is a way to account for this denial. When a man looks at materialistic sex, he seems to see it as follows. Sex is a commodity that can be bought. Women sell sex and men buy sex. Whoring is the transaction of selling sex for some material gain. Therefore, if a woman puts out because you bought her dinner, she is a whore. In this example, sex is the thing bought and dinner is the currency used to pay with. Now, what if we change the exchange around? What if dinner was the thing bought and sex was the currency with which it was paid for? Taken in this light, sex from the perspective of a woman can be seen as a currency instead of a commodity. From this perspective, materialistic sex can no longer be viewed as whoring since the buyer and seller are reversed. Prostitution, in this way, becomes a form of currency exchange. Now, the question becomes, which model is more appropriate? Now, I would posit that both uh, hold, a, uh, hold explanatory force with respect to the psychologies of each sex. So, in order to account for men's judgments, one ought to adopt the commodity model. To account for women's judgments, one ought to adopt the currency model. Let us take some examples. Men in general argue that sex is a mutually reciprocal exchange as both parties receive the same thing. However, this is quantitatively true and not necessarily qualitatively true. For example, exchanging one American dollar for one Canadian dollar is quantitatively equal, but due to the difference in value, it is qualitatively unequal. Now, there are many arguments Pre, well, present in MGTOW discourse as to the elevated value of female reproductive capacities compared to the male. Karen Strong would say, you know, an egg may go for 10,000, but an ejaculation for 10 cents. Though it is possible that the quantitative and qualitative value of hedonistic sex may be equal, namely, both parties experience an equal amount of pleasure, to assume this the case may in fact be incorrect. Now, C.S. MGTOW, in a recent video, cited some study about women uh, with rich partners reporting experiencing a greater number of orgasms. If it indeed is the case that a woman believes a man will get more out of a sexual encounter than she will, then that woman implicitly values her own sexuality above the sexuality of that man. For example, she may believe that the man gains pleasure, while she gains pleasure but loses status by upping her par partner count. When such an exchange is considered under the currency model, it is likely the woman would weigh the value of sex obtained from a man in a similar manner she weighs her own. If this is true, then the value of the material goods a man needs to offer in order to equalize the price she is paying is the offset from the value she places upon sex from such a man. For example, an average Joe may need to bundle dinner and drinks if dinner and drinks, in her mind, elevate the value of the package he is selling to match the value she places on sex from her. However, a rock star could get her to bundle dinner and much more, as she will value sex from him much higher than she believes sex from her alone is worth. What about women sleeping their way to the top? In such cases, it makes more sense to speak about these women buying promotions rather than men paying for sex with promotions. 
If sex is indeed a form of currency, then it would seem that women can pay with two currencies, the hard cash issued by the state and sex. Now, it is observed that men earn the larger share of income. It is also said that it is women who command 80% of all income even though they earn the smaller share. I speculate that the proportional difference is the current value of the female sexual currency in circulation. So if all incomes of all people are, say, 100 billion, men earn 60 billion, but women command 80 billion, then the value of the female sexual currency in circulation is 40 billion. However, I do not believe that that 40 billion would have a direct connection to the sex act itself. Prostitutes, for example, report that men will pay just to spend time with them. Cuddle cafes are becoming a thing. It is likely that it is not merely sex that serves women as a secondary currency, but more generally female affection and validation. Now, it would hardly seem appropriate to call a woman a whore who is selling hugs, yet the motivations of the man who will pay for a hug is only different in degree and not in kind from the man who will pay for sex. Both motivations stem from some inner desire for female closeness and fulfillment of some primal sexual compulsion. Men will pay for things like sex and the girlfriend experience, and they see such things as goods. Yet from the other direction, a woman sees she can buy things with hugs and sex, and so sees it as a currency. Men stuck in the friend zone, dishing out gifts and favors in hope they will secure a romantic relationship, eventually begin to feel cheated. They grow bitter. They saw the exchange ultimately unfair. The woman, however, continues to accept his gifts and favors because she feels her company alone is worth such gifts and favors. That is what the man negotiated. She has paid her dues to him and feels no remorse and perhaps resents uh, at the man's feeling entitled to more. After all, she can believe the man is acting entitled only if she believes all exchanges between the two have been squared, that she has honored the deal. And what was the deal the man made in exchange for his gifts and favors? Well, to be her friend. We as men may call such women manipulators, yet no injustice has taken place in the exchange itself. If the price for gifts and favors is merely to bat her eyelashes, why ought she to offer more? He sold his services without negotiating for anything well, but an illusion spun in his head that enough niceness will get him more, as if the terms of the contract would magically renegotiate themselves. This behavior in women, this realization that she can get things through tapping into the male sexual desire, is this not the essence of whoring? The prostitute, who desires cash, taps into the male desire for the sex act. The tinder girl, who desires food, taps into the male desire for the sex act. The wife or girlfriend, who desires a new kitchen, taps into the male desire for the sex act. Yet of these three, it is only the prostitute who must fulfill the expectation. The other two need only insinuate its possibility. All three cases follow the same mechanism. A man parts with resources or time to fulfill a female desire compelled by his sex drive. The actualization of sex is contingent. All women use their sexuality as a currency from the very first moments they realize they can get boys to do things for them by simply being nice. Some pay with sex, some with affection, and others with little more than hope. Though not every sex act or act of kindness a woman partakes in should be considered as such, this secondary currency is always available to spend. Some women do so prodigally, others less so. Every girlfriend or wife who ever gave a blowjob to get her way is guilty. Every woman who has ever led a guy on for favors is guilty. Every woman who has ever paid with any form of the secondary currency is guilty. This is the whorishness we MGTOW must mean as it seems to account for all cases and describe what we see all women participating in in one form or another. So yes, under this account, all women are whores, even the virgins. Thanks for listening. Go team.